and how binding modulates conformation and function and how mutations can perturb drug binding affinities to cause drug resistance. Uh, he is the recipient of numerous awards, including the BIH Einstein Visiting Fellowship, Silicon Therapeutics Open Science Fellowship, the Lewis Gerster Young Investigator Award, the QB3 Berkeley Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellowship, an IBM Predoctoral Fellowship, um, as well as, as many others. He holds a BS in biology from Caltech and a PhD in biophysics from UC San Francisco. He completed his postdoc at Stanford and at UC Berkeley as a QB3 fellow. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him with us today. Please help me to welcome John. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, it's fantastic to be here today to tell you a little bit about what our laboratory does. Um, if I can get the slide to advance, then see. There we go. So I'm at the Sloan Kettering Institute, which is the basic science arm of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. It's a cancer center, so we see a lot of cancer patients. Uh, but there's 100 basic science researchers in this wonderful building, the Zuckerman Research Center. We have a very interdisciplinary uh, crowd of computational systems biologists. We're in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, right next to Rockefeller University, if you've heard of that. And all of our graduate students come from the Weill Cornell Graduate School of Medical Sciences. Um, just going to see if I can get this. To go. I have to turn it on here. Like, <laughs> there we go. So I'm going to take you. Uh, uh, sorry, if I can go back one more. There we go. Let's see if this works. All right, I got it to work now. Great. So uh, we're very lucky uh, to work on uh, problems in in trying to accelerate drug discovery. Drug discovery is very difficult, as many of you know, uh, and it's it's very important for us to figure out um, how we can. Uh, overcome some of the challenges that frustrate our ability of the species to come up with new drugs. The success rate for, for a drug discovery program is something like two to 4%, uh, which is ridiculous if you consider that you're spending effectively billions of dollars to discover every new approved drug. If you were gonna uh, build a bridge, for example, nobody would give you a billion dollars to build a bridge if you knew there was a 4% chance of success. So to try to increase these success rates, we're focusing on building second generation models um, that either use these atomistic molecular simulations, I'll tell you a little bit about these, or uh, more advanced machine learning approaches that integrate aspects of AI at different levels and operate on very cool hardware. I think these graphics processors that Anima and her colleagues are very, uh, very good at delivering for us, uh, or even large scale computing resources. We also have a wet lab. This wet lab is specialized for uh, generating the data that's needed to make these models work. And that's very different from generating data necessary to make a drug, um, uh, because it turns out you're, you're after different goals and trying to build, build better models. So with this little robotic undergraduate in our wet lab, and it goes around and collects data for us all day. And we also use other artisanally crafted tiny robots that are made in Brooklyn, for example, that are just a few thousand dollars that anyone can have on their bench top. So what we're trying to do is to develop these predictive models that will be useful for guiding drug discovery and helping other folks actually achieve molecules that achieve certain objectives that would make a good drug. <clears throat> We'd also like to make people uh, enable people to make statistically sound decisions in, in making decisions about drug discovery, because again, it's an expensive endeavor uh, and there are lives at risk if you do it in a poor way. And finally, we'd like to improve, you know, have some impact, real impact, real world impact on both drug discovery and clinical applications. So we're very lucky, sorry, I'll stand over here where it's closer. We're very lucky to have um, uh, the ability to work with a variety of diff different, uh, let me get this to cooperate. Sorry for the uh, slide rave. Um, <laughs> we're very lucky to be able to work with a wide variety of collaborators, either folks who are, are actively engaged in drug discovery, where we collaborate on open science problems, and open source software that makes drug discovery easier for everyone, as well as large scale data generator, generators or other large collaborations, some of which I'll tell you about today. Um, and, and other academic collaborators are also wonderful. So given that background out of the way and we figured out the slide advancing, I wanna take you a little bit back in time to, you'll probably remember 25th of February, 2020, where the front page headline was that the CDC was warning that the United States was 
potentially going to have a coronavirus outbreak. And of course, the United States, not to be outdone by any other country in the world, we had to be the best at it. So one month later, we were leading the world in coronavirus cases, right? It was bad news for everybody. We were all wondering what could we do individually as laboratories together with our collaborators to aid the global coronavirus response effort. So we did what we naturally do. We tried to figure out how we can contribute and one of the ways in which we thought we could contribute was in developing new therapeutics, new oral antivirals. We thought this would be absolutely necessary as part of a strategy for addressing the coronavirus pandemic, because for vaccines, we would need complete safety for vaccinating 100% of the people. Of course, in the United States, it's also very difficult to achieve vaccination of 100% of the people, uh, just in general. And if you have a vaccine, of course, there's resistance that can emerge, as we're seeing right now, whereas an antiviral could avoid this resistance from emerging. Uh, if you could target something that was more stable and a different target within the virus. A normal pill also wouldn't have the same cold storage requirements that a, a vaccine would have, which would make it a lot easier to distribute globally. You could just put it on a pallet and ship it somewhere. And then if you had really safe oral antivirals, you could also protect patients who are at risk where other things weren't easy for them to, to take, especially if they were immunocompromised. And so given all of this information, we thought we would absolutely need uh, the development of new oral antivirals. Um, these are important in a particular phase of the disease. Whoops, Let's see if I can come back. I'm going to drive from here if that's all right. All right. Here we go. Okay, so if we if we have direct acting antivirals, uh, then they would be useful for a particular point in the disease, which would be uh, after vaccination, right? Vaccination would require that you give the vaccine early enough to actually impact. But if somebody's sick already, it's not going to help. You need the antiviral in the early stages of disease, um, where you can potentially treat while the virus is still driving infection. Potentially, maybe even later in the disease as well, where you want to avoid post post acute sequelae, these long COVID things that we've been hearing about. Now, the cool thing was that we got genomic information very early in the pandemic. On 24th of January, 2020, the data was disclosed that it was a coronavirus and it was very similar to SARS or the same viruses that caused the SARS and MERS outbreaks. In fact, it was so similar in particular regions that the proteins look identical. So on in February 5th of 2020, we got structures for the main viral protease, which looks almost identical to the SARS-CoV-1 uh, protease. This was good news because we knew something about this particular protease. We thought it might be a viable tar drug target for COVID-19. The reason why this might be a really interesting idea is that this protease is essential in the life cycle of this virus. What it does is that when the virus comes in, this RNA genome uh, translates the pro this polyprotein, which has a bunch of different viral proteins in it, one after the other, that are all connected together. And this protease needs to chew that up in 11 different places in order to separate those so that the virus can mature and go on to infect other cells. Now, we can't do that if you inhibit the protease by blocking this active site. And it's really hard to mutate 11 different, uh, 11 different places in the genome at the same time. So it's a good target for drug discovery. Now, the problem was that we did know a little bit about previously exist or how to inhibit this through other means. These are all peptidomimetic inhibitors, and they're also covalent inhibitors. This work was done after the first SARS-1 pandemic, but then people gave up. They were really interested in preparing this further or in pursuing this further when there were no more patients. So this is two problems with it, one of which is that these peptidomimetics are very hard to orally formulate. That is, you can't get something that's not an IV drug. Uh, IVs are great, but you have to get to the hospital to get them, and people weren't getting to the hospital when they needed to in the early stages of infection. They're also covalent. That's really difficult to optimize to prevent off-target issues because it could bind to other off-target proteins and cause cause disease. Now, of course, the exception here is that uh, Pfizer did an amazing job with neurotrophy, as we'll hear about uh, a little bit later. So this process of drug discovery is usually really long and uh, fraught with peril, right? So it takes something like 10 to 20 years to get all the way from knowing your target to being able to actually give the drug to people uh, on, on the market. Um, it also takes a huge amount of money, especially when you consider all the failures that are going in. And right now we're here. So uh, how do we cut this timeline shorter, right? Our naive goal, being a bunch of uh, possibly overconfident scientists, was to say, maybe we could short, shortcut this somewhat, somehow, short-circuit this and accelerate the whole process for drug discovery. 
fortunately, we had some superpowers with us. One of them is this giant synchrotron in diamond uh, or the diamond light source in uh, Oxford, United Kingdom. What they are able to do is grow these really tiny little crystals of proteins. And given that they can grow them in these special high density plates, they actually use this really cool technique of dispensing compounds in DMSO. These are small things that look like fragments of drugs using ultrasonic dispensing that shapes a little droplet pulse that shoots a nanoliter droplet that soaks onto the surface of this crystal. And if the small molecule in there binds well, it'll actually pull it into the active site and then you'll be able to resolve that in the electron density within the site. So this fully automated system will use a robot to pick up all these little tiny crystals and it will shoot them in this intense X-ray collimated source and from all of that information, you can reassemble these data sets and see there's a small amount of this ligand binding in this particular binding site. You can get the structures of all of those parts of the, of the ligand uh, for doing this in very high throughput. Now, that, remember I said the structure came out February 5th, but it turns out Haitao Yang's lab in, in uh, Shanghai had to shut down because of, uh, because of COVID. So they transmitted the sequence of the plasmid directly to diamond. They were able to make it and then transform it to bacteria, make the protein, uh, get crystals, and then shoot a huge number of these structures using their fully automated beam line. So in just a few weeks, they had done an entire X-ray fragment screen to get all of these little molecules bound to the active site. They put all the data online right immediately. In fact, they tweeted the data out, which is the primary mechanism of dissemination for this particular data set. So this is pre-preprinting, moving at, at lightning pace. So when you look at all of the, the fragments that are bound, this is one of the monomers of the dimer, you can see that they kind of completely fill this active site, which is really cool from a drug discovery perspective, because if you're not used to looking at these things, uh, you might, might not know what you're looking at, but if you look very closely, you'll see there's filling all of the major pockets here that this substrate peptide would sit in. So if you can somehow fill, fill this with a high affinity ligand, you can prevent the virus from maturing and then hopefully stop at, uh, both COVID infection, COVID transmission, and if you squint at the data very closely, you'll see that there's pairs of these fragments that look like they really overlap in space. They have these moieties that are in the same point in space so that maybe I could just take these two things and then come up with a molecule that somehow incorporates multiple features of them and then make a high affinity ligand an inhibitor, maybe a drug right away by merging these force potent inhibitors. So it turns out we don't, we, we've done this for a number of decades, right? Fragment-based drug discovery is an old technology we still don't know which methods are the best. We think that there's computational strategies that are very fast at this, but we have no idea which ones are the best. So a collaborator who was already working with us in Diamond Light Source at the time said, what if we try everything at the same time? And this is a crazy idea. Um, so we needed a crazy name. We called it the COVID moonshot. Uh, and we decided that we would pursue this as an open science project just because we wanted everybody's input on this. We wanted to make all the data open immediately upon receipt. We do this patent free so we wouldn't have to negotiate with tech transfer offices while we were doing this. And it would be for the good of humanity. We would make molecules that would hopefully inspire further downstream drug discovery. And if we make, make it all the way to a drug, we'll focus on low and middle income countries and global equitable and affordable access. So we started a webpage. Uh, Alpha Lee, who's the uh, uh, Cambridge group leader and the head of a company called Postera, which is an AI drug discovery company, put up this wonderful webpage. They started a molecule sketcher. You could submit ideas. And then we said we would make them. So uh, Near London tweeted this, and it turns out we got a lot of response, way more than we anticipated. There were a lot of folks at home that were dying to contribute in some way. Many of them had their own cool technologies that they could draw on. Some of them were medicinal chemists who were just interested in trying their hand at, at drug discovery through the web. We got a ton of different submissions from all sorts of different folks. It turns out that we got over 7,000 submissions from over 350 different designers. I'll walk you through it, just what a couple of these look like. Some folks have put clearly a lot of thought into this uh, and designed really interesting molecules that try to engage many of the different parts you see in that binding site, uh, the little sites where normally the amino acid site chains would stick into. Um, we also captured the design rationale for all of these. So some of them were very interesting and, and kind of cryptic and maybe way too small, thinking that, uh, you know, this person had clearly used one particular parameter in drug discovery and tried to optimize for that, which is not a good idea. You really need to satisfy multiple criteria. Another set of designs had really interesting rationale that gold is thiophilic, so these can be sourced from e-molecules and tested prospectively. Uh, 
kind of weird, wacky looking molecules. Others were very strange, extremely small, possibly explosive. Uh, and this one, I particularly like the rationale. I'm looking for common, inexpensive, widely available compounds, preferably volatile, that humans already safely inhale and if possible, enjoy inhaling. <laughs> this is just carbon. Um, probably not going to be a drug. Maybe it can fit into certain pockets, but uh, it's going to have other problems with things like solubility. I appreciated this one, certainly. You know, I use random numbers to uh, find drugs as well because we use Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and of course, my favorite is this one where you know, I'm sure it works. <laughs> it'll, it'll certainly help in some way, right? So, okay, we've clearly got a lot of submissions. Some of them are completely nuts. We need some way to filter through all of these ideas. Luckily, so my lab uses a lot of physical models in addition to machine learning models. These physical models are very general to be called upon when there's not a lot of data. We're in a very different data regime from something like, you know, uh, training uh, GPT um, or something like that, GPT-3 or 4, where you're talking about, you know, the ratio of molecules you might make in a drug discovery program is about 2,000 molecules total. By that time, you're already done. And so it's looking at how can I learn the entire Library of Congress with a single book, right? It's a very different ratio regime. So these physical models can very nicely generalize in the low data regime. You can use them to filter out really crazy ideas, not necessarily find the best idea. Uh, and we use that to screen out a bunch of, bunch of them. And then the other important part is that we have to be able to make these molecules. We have to be able to make them on an extremely short time scale, which means we're limited to like maybe one or two step, maybe three step reactions. We have to use building blocks that are in stock by our partners, folks like Enemy, who have been with us since the actual beginning uh, in, in Ukraine. Wuxi is in China, Sai is in India. They have very large stocks of building blocks in stock that allow them to put together things with robust reactions. And very fortunately, this molecular transformer, a really cool machine learning method that thinks about uh, chemistry like words and sentences uh, that can help retrosynthesize things. You put in a molecule and you get back a route that uses these building blocks in stock, like words in the language about how to assemble them. Uh, and you can get a very good idea of, of how many, of what, which compounds you could make using which schemes, whether it's complex or not. So using this, we were able to make a record number of compounds, 850 compounds in just a few weeks and test them all. And we were able to put all of the data online immediately. So the data that we did collect was able to be reported back very rapidly. We put it on the web page such that as soon as you get, uh, get to the web page, you can browse all of the data directly. So I can go back. And uh, in addition to that, because we had this fully automated uh, diamond light source working with us, we were able to also gather all the structural data for essentially every compound that soaked into the uh, into the crystals and put that online as well. So we knew exactly how everything bound in this particular active site. This was really transformative because normally you just have a few crystal structures during the entire process to be able to uh, support your drug discovery program. But here we have visuals of basically everything. So what was really interesting about this approach is that it did reveal uh, a lot of really clever merges. This one is a human merging these compounds by, by eye essentially finding a bunch of interesting overlaps and proposing something that is very easy to assemble in a single step or so uh, that engages the same features of all of them and gets us to the point where we actually have a detectable affinity. So these fragments that I was telling you about don't really have a measurable affinity. They're too weak. You could just see a little bit of imperfections in the electron density that allow you to resolve how it's binding. But here we're actually able to get a potency. It's, it has an IC50 of about uh, 20 micromolar or something like that. It's measurable, it gets us on the map and allows us to now iterate to make this compound better. In fact, we got a lot of these different series because we we're getting structures for all of them. We had like a primary series and multiple backups. These were really interesting because you could make them in one step from four different components. And that was super cool because you could try a lot of diversity very quickly and iterate very easily. Others had been seen on screens for SARS-CoV-1 before, which is really interesting and got us to believe that we're potentially on the right track. But of course, you can't simply say, okay, I've got a drug. It's not like that at all. We're very early in the process. We've moved from here to here. That is, we have an early lead compound that we can then optimize uh, to actually make it have the properties that you would actually want to have in, as a drug. I was very fortunate that the last conference of 2020 I had attended, I had gone to this wonderful keynote by this guy, Ed Griffin, a medicinal chemist, ex, ex AstraZeneca oncology vet, who had been talking about how AI could actually have real impact in drug discovery and how computation and medicinal chemistry can work together. Um, he reached out to us on Twitter, fatal mistake. We absolutely drew him into the collaboration to become our medicinal chemistry lead. And uh, he, he basically helped us design our game plan for moving on from here. So 
We're aiming for small, efficient molecules to speed things up and reduce the cost of development. We're avoiding these peptide mimetics because we couldn't orally formulate them easily. It took Pfizer a billion dollars to take what was essentially a really good drug that was IV only and reformulate it as a uh, uh, as a orally available drug. And it, you know, 350 people are named in that in that particular paper. Uh, for us, we were focusing on potency first and then adding covalency later, so we didn't have to worry about the time required to avoid off targets. We were aiming for you know just addressing this pandemic. We'll worry about the next one later. Um, what's really important is that a real drug discovery program has to have a statement of your objectives. And these objectives are what you'd want the actual molecule to satisfy in order to convince someone that you actually want to take it into a preclinical program where things get very expensive. It's like six plus million dollars to do a preclinical study to convince the FDA that you'd like to put it into a human and that they're going to be okay with that. You need, obviously, it has to hit your particular target. That is, it has to inhibit the protease, which is what we're aiming for in a biochemical assay. It actually has to do the same thing in cells as well. So it has to get into the cell. It has to be soluble enough, partition across the lipid membranes. You want it to hit a specific spectrum of these things. Um, if you're going to give it an orally, it has to be highly soluble. Uh, and it, of course, has to stick around long enough in human bloodstream at high enough concentrations to actually do what you want, which is to have that antiviral effect. That's very hard to predict, but there are ways to do it. Usually you do rat experiments, dog experiments. Um, there's also a whole panel of safety concerns you have to worry about as well. These are sort of the common modes that things can fail. One of them, for example, is HERG, where if you inhibit this channel in the heart, you could cause all sorts of weird adverse cardiac effects, and you don't want people dropping dead from those. So you have to worry about those safety <laughs> aspects as well. And the way you achieve these is that you design what's called an assay cascade. So this is a series of different assays that are surrogates for a lot of the properties that I mentioned on the previous slide. The object, instead of the objectives, these are the ways we measure our progress towards the objectives. They're approximations of the real thing, which is, does it work in humans? But they help us, especially if you organize them into cheap and fast things, and then more expensive things that take more time, especially where you have to go into a BSL-3 laboratory for working with viruses. And then finally, when you're sacrificing animal lives, you have to be very cautious about how you do that. It's also much more expensive and time consuming. For those of you who think about this from the machine learning perspective, this is clearly a multidimensional optimization problem. If you start off with a few samples from this corner of your hypercube of all of these goals, you're trying to get to the other corner of the 17 dimensional hypercube by optimizing, by taking a stochastic path through these different design iterations. So most of your time is spent here in this lead optimization cascade uh, cycle where you're going through what's called the design, make, test, and analyze cycle, DMTA. So you'll make some new designs about what molecules you think you can synthesize based upon the current chemistry and the current best molecules. Then you'll uh, go ahead and actually make them. Hopefully you can make most of them. You'll then test them when they come in and you'll figure out what to do based upon the information that comes in. And hopefully you get past those criteria so you can send more and more compounds, especially towards the end of the program, all the way down to hopefully being able to put these into humans or convince someone that they want to put them into humans. Much of these cycles have this kind of operation. So we've got a good hit. We need to figure out how to take it apart and then put it back together again. We can use the molecular transformers and other machine learning methods for this. Um, we can figure out that at the last step, for example, in this last blading catalyzed coupling, we can install any number of maybe 25,000 different building blocks. We need to figure out which ones we're actually going to try to make because a good chemist can maybe make a dozen analogs in a week per chemist. So the chemists will generally select analogs that are very conservative, that probe a few specific hypotheses according to a specific playbook. But there's a lot of stuff that's missing from them, right? What if we had a way to look for anything that the chemists might have overlooked, which might be a really quick molecule hiding, like a gem hiding in the rough? So what we can do is we can use our computational approaches to actually go through the entire set. So we use these particular things called alchemical free energy calculations. It's a funny name. It's called alchemy because you're converting a one molecule into another molecule or one molecule into a ghost molecule that doesn't interact with anything in a way that can't happen in chemistry. So it's an alchemical transformation. But of course, it's not chemistry, it's a computer. We can write down probability densities that we can introduce into our Hamiltonians that we're simulating from with Markov chain Monte Carlo, an arbitrary coupling parameter lambda, which takes us from one ligand to another ligand design. So one of these is generally something that we've made. The other one is something that we'd like to make, but we don't know if it's better or worse. But by doing this using Markov chain Monte Carlo, we can estimate how well it will bind it's in, with a way that's orders of magnitude faster than just watching it, watching it associate or dissociate. These things all use these molecular mechanics potentials right now. This is a, an ancient uh, low-order harmonic expansion and low-order Fourier series for most of the quantum chemistry. 
So it's a really crappy uh, approximation, but it worked well at a PDP 11. So we're still stuck using it, which is pretty silly. A lot of this will probably be re replaced in the next few years with more machine learned neural potentials. Uh, we're certainly working on that ourselves. And there's some physical interactions that have to do with repulsion and some dispersion attractions and then some electrostatics between different atoms. Now, the problem is that these uh, force fields uh, have been parameterized mostly by hand over many years where you put graduate students into the top and then outcome parameters that you hope people will eventually use. Um, and something like, you know, if you look at all the parameters that go into it, even a reasonably heterogeneous system, it's something like a hundred different human years have gone into making one of these force fields uh, that's then really hard to improve. So we've been working with the Open Force Field Consortium, which is a, uh, a, a collaboration that aims to produce next generation open source software and open data sets that are used to make better force fields for all of drug discovery. Uh, we've gone through several generations, Parsley and now Sage. And over the years, so these are force fields that were finished when I started graduate school that we were kind of stuck with for a long time. And then in just one generation of using automated machine learning principles to improve the force field, it's already improved things absolutely considerably. And we can do this iteratively uh, every quarter, basically. The next generation models of this are all looking at how to think about molecules like graphs, because it turns out that they have a lot of the same kinds of isomorphisms and can encode chemi chemical equivalences in the right way. And then using these next generation ways to learn very rapidly. So we've taken this from 100 computer, 100, 100 human years of effort down to about a day to actually do this automatically. So using these force fields, we found that when we did some quick retrospective calculations, we were actually able to predict or retrodict, I should say, how things were looking on this lead series pretty well. So we thought we could, we'd actually put this into production. But typically we do a few dozen compounds at a time, not tens of thousands of them. So we need enough GPUs to actually score tens of thousands of compounds. Now, our lab was very lucky that we're part of the Folding at Home Consortium here, which is a worldwide global consortium of different laboratories where folks around the world will run what used to be a screensaver and is now just a little client program in the background. Usually they're gamers, they have graphics processors, and they have to sleep at some point, possibly during the day. Um, and so they'll turn our software on and we can run calculations on it. So we had something like 100 petaflops of, of, F, of computing power available. Maybe 100,000 people were, were online at that time. We thought we'd absolutely be able to use this as part of our effort to engage uh, the rest of the world and have them contribute. So we put up a little blog post just about all the different ways we and our collaborators were working with collaborators to try to aid um, the coronavirus pandemic effort. And all of a sudden, we had a million people sign up over just a few, few months. So we ended up with one and a half exaflops of aggregated computing effort, which is completely insane. Something like $6.8 billion per year on AWS if they even have the capacity to do that, greater than the top of the, the sum of the top 10 supercomputers. And all of a sudden we had this really global effort where laboratories around the world were contributing their experimental capabilities. And then uh, people around the world were computer contributing their computing abilities to actually help our effort. Now, another problem is that we didn't actually have a good algorithm that would run on this very constrained folding at home distributed computing platform. So for those of you who run Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations, there's a wide variety of different fancy sampling algorithms that you use. Replica exchange or Hamiltonian replica exchange is, is currently considered the best, uh, but it doesn't really well, run well if you have a completely decoupled system where you have to wor worry about a single GPU at a time. So it turns out I had sat next to Gavin Crooks uh, during my time as a fellow at Berkeley, and he had come up with this new, new law of statistical mechanics called the Crooks fluctuation theorem, which I thought was pretty crazy at the time. Uh, but he had used that along with some collaborators in little optical trap experiments where they have a little protein or nucleic acid in between two laser traps and showed how you can drive the system out of equilibrium and measure the work expended in doing so. And if you do this exactly the reverse way, and many times, you can get back the free energy difference between those two states. So we can do that as well. We can drive these back and forth between two different states, allowing to relax the equilibrium in between by going back and forth between two Hamiltonians for molecule we've made and then molecule we're interested in and then collecting these work trajectories in a way that gives us an optimal estimate of the free energy difference of the two which i thought was just really cool to be able to take take a new method from one one domain to another domain so we generated a huge amount of data each week it was something like 10 milliseconds of simulation time for those of you who haven't uh, played with this before we had a gofundme because we had, couldn't find any grant funding to actually uh, pay for chemistry we put up these progress bars and people really uh, 
came together to help us uh, help contribute their computing effort into these efforts. And we went through these many iterations of being able to actually make select, uh, significantly better compounds uh, that improve the affinity of lower numbers are better in this case. We learned a whole lot in doing this and working with the humans. First of all, many of these designs, because they come from a random virtual library, are actually a lot worse than the compounds we had already had. So we didn't necessarily improve things. Um, or there were, were very few designs, rather, that would actually improve things in the overall scheme of things. And we, when we look at the computational library score, uh, scored compared to how humans were doing things, it turns out the humans are actually significant. These are Ed and Ralph. They're significantly left shifted towards better compound designs, but they can only enumerate a certain number of designs. If we go through the entire library, of course, we're able to come up with many better, many designs that are predicted to be better than the human designs. We put up a dashboard so that the chemists and everyone else could look at this and see how the progress was going in real time, see what floated to the top of the leaderboard. Um, the leaderboard showed us what we thought was reliable and what we thought was going to be more potent. Um, some really interesting things happened, like Humans submitted ideas that were actually a little bit difficult to make, but uh, predicted to be much more potent, often floated to the top. So that led the chemists to actually prioritize the synthesis of the, some of these compounds and the spending of more synthetic resources on them. It was really satisfying to see when the crystal structure would come back, how it'd be almost identical to the actual predicted poses uh, that we had uploaded. All of this is still online and interactive. People can play with it and download all of our data. So in the end, I'm not showing you a lot of the work that was done here, but this is the milestones on the way to the first compound that satisfied that target candidate profile, those objectives that I presented to you at the beginning. Uh, and so we put all of this into a preprint. It said um, we were still working on backup compounds. Um, we also talked about how well the actual computational models work. It's not perfect. It's still very heartening though. There's a lot of work to do in integrating more learnability into these models. And I think there's really exciting interfaces I won't have time to tell you about in terms of machine learning and uh, how to improve these things. Um, but then we put all the data into a preprint uh, and we updated that preprint multiple times as we were getting better compounds. The cool thing is that this preprint uh, reports something like 20,000 different unique designs and 2,200 compounds that were made and tested. It's completely open. As far as I know, it's like one of the only open complete drug discovery data sets out there. There's more than 850 X-ray structures, which is a huge fraction of all coronavirus structures. It was really heartening to see that Shinobi recently had a compound called Incitrovir. When they put out their preprint disclosing this, it's a, a non-covalent inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2 and Pro like Paxlovid. Um, and it was approved in Japan in November. Um, it's a really great compound. It's one compound per day, one pill per day instead of six pills per day. And it doesn't have eight and a half pages of drug-drug interactions like Paxlovid does. So, does. so it's a much larger audience of, of people are, can actually take this compound. But in figure 2B of the preprint, that's our compound. That's the one I showed you up there where we disclosed the structure very rapidly. They use that to actually extract what's called a pharmacophore model and then find compounds in their late stage pain program that they understood really well. And it turns out they had some hits that they could rapidly develop into in central beer. So even doing just open science is able to accelerate for profit drug discovery in ways that actually really help people. We were lucky enough to get $11 million from the Wellcome Trust and the uh, World Health Organization's Access to COVID Tools Accelerator to actually take our compound without a patent all the way to hopefully clinical trials where we're now at the accelerated preclinical phase where you convince the FDA or some of the regulatory agency that you could do clinical trials on humans. We're lining up partners to do all of this basically straight to generics through the clinical trials and then manufacture for extremely low cost with the idea that low and middle income countries still need access to low cost antivirals. It was a crazy ride. And what was really interesting is that when you look at our compounds, they're all equipoised against SARS-CoV-1. So we ended up doing something that could have been done in 2004, but nobody wanted to spend a few million dollars to make compounds that were for a disease that might not occur again within the lifetime of the patent. So this is a market failure, but it's not something that we're gonna see only once, right? The global, climate change crisis is going to cause more animal reservoirs to be pushed into closer proximity to humans, leading to what people are calling the pandemicine. So we're going to see more and more of these pandemics with time. And we already knew that was on top of the antimicrobial resistance, where uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria are going to be the number one killer by 2050 as we return to pre-penicillin days, which is not good at all. So in thinking about you know, what did we learn from this and how can we prevent future pandemics, you think about what is the best way to win a, win a race, right? 
simply we can cheat. We want to run fast, and then we want to also start close to the finish line, right? Those are the two best ways to do that. We can do that here. We can develop a platform that ideally takes all of our learnings, packs it in with machine learning and art artificial intelligence to accelerate the discovery of oral antivirals that are similar to what we've done already. We can eliminate all these inefficiencies in human-based discovery, which are many, and we can repeatedly exercise this platform to actually develop a whole arsenal of drugs that are pan-viral activity for a lot of different viruses of pandemic concern. Turns out there was someone else crazy enough to think about this. So actually during the very, build, uh, very beginning of the Biden administration was able to persuade the president to set aside $3.2 billion for what's called the antiviral program for pandemics to get this started. It's only the first part, but our, uh, we were then funded uh, to become one of these antiviral drug discovery centers, along with eight others in the United States. But the idea is to discover drugs openly, this whole cabinet full of, of um, uh, pan-viral uh, antivirals uh, for global, equitable, and affordable access. And so we have this entire thing organized like a biotech from target ID all the way to preclinical development, and then working with clinical development partners downstream to actually translate these into things that could become medicines on people's shelves. And the cool thing about this is unlike normal drug discovery companies where you just have all of these targets and no visibility to what's going on between them, we're getting all of our data openly so that you'll be able to drill down and see every piece of data that we've generated for this entire program and use this to hopefully build better models as well. This is an unprecedented opportunity to flow millions of dollars of chemistry through computational models where we can try out different ideas. We can have other folks work with us uh, to test out their models prospectively. It's often very difficult to be able to put a few million dollars behind every prospective experiment for every kind of methodology paper you publish. But this is an amazing opportunity for AI and ML methods to assess how well they're doing and even drive some of these programs. Uh, certainly, it's a lot harder for humans to uh, make optimal decisions. This is how most of the decisions were made in our discovery program, a bunch of faces on a Zoom call. Um, but when you look at what we were doing, right, we're looking at how well do each of these, how well are we moving towards our target by measuring against different sets of, of assays. Um, and this really starts to look like an amortized inference problem. If you think about, I'm trying to make a model of how well these molecules actually bind, how well they actually work in humans. I have all of these cheaper surrogates and I'm learning information as I go along. I'll have a lot more at the top than at the bottom. And I can build prospective models for all of these different stages, some of which are amenable to physical-like models that can learn parameters from data. Others are uh, can be ligand-based models where I don't have to worry about target-dependent properties. Um, and then when you start to make decisions, it really looks like these ideas in making decisions in chess or in Go, right? Thinking about many possible futures given my current decision and how will those futures play out if I apply my models and, and use uncertainty to pr uh, predict how things are going to go. So it really starts to look like a machine learning problem where you can impose an autonomous discovery workflow to make these decisions for you. It turns out these discovery programs for antivirals are often very easy. The target candidate profile isn't very sophisticated. A lot of these things for proteases, for different viruses, all look the same. So you can impose the same kind of technology, same kind of strategy, pursue any of the targets that you, you can go through, and then automate as much as you can to reduce these closed loop uh, uh, design, make, test, analyze cycles. What's needed though, is that if you think about who is making the decision, is it automated? And who is making the compounds um, uh, or the designing the compound ideas, scoring them, this frontier is like being able to automate the entire thing. There's really no one working in that space right now, but that's where all of us would like to be. I think Anima predicted that a huge fraction of drug discovery is amenable to this kind of automated decision-making, but it takes time and effort and, and actual data to actually make this work. So uh, I want to thank you all for listening to me and thank the huge number of collaborators. This is just a very small fraction of them. Um, also, especially thank the uh, chemists and enemy who have still been taking Zoom calls even in between uh, bomb raids. It's, it's been absolutely fantastic to work with them. And then all of the folks in my lab um, who have been uh, graceful enough to allow me to do this uh, during the last couple of years. And thank you folks for your attention. That was really good. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so I wonder, I mean, you made all this data available to the public, and it brings to mind, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm overthinking the risk, but it brings to mind the risk that perhaps uh, there could be a, um, a company that uses the data and, you know, exploits it, puts a patent down, puts a, puts a block in your way. And I would, the way software companies deal, I mean, so open software deals with this is with licensing. Um, I was wondering, which is usually done with software, not with data. So I was wondering what you did with respect to the licensing of your data. That, that's a great question. So um, the idea of how do you patent things for diseases that don't exist yet is an interesting and fascinating one that nobody quite knows the answer to. Certainly for emergent pandemics, you know that you want to do something different from current diseases where you don't want to block competitors from making better second generation molecules because you might need them, especially if resistance develops. So trying to rethink this process is, has been really interesting. For this first generation effort, we made all the data available that kind of plows the field with salt for people that want to like make a compound that is, or just take one of those compounds because they can't get a composition of matter. We're hoping we won't have rogue, act rogue actors who patent the process or the, the use um, where you could block, would basically have to license theirs to manufacture ours. That would just be profit seeking. Uh, we've kind of been a little bit guarded by not telling the public which exact compounds we're taking forward for development, even though all the data is out there. So we just haven't been able to disclose which one we're carrying forward until we file that IMD. So we've had to be a little bit cagey, but all the data is still available. And as you've seen that, you know, people can use this data to build on and, and make better molecules. For the future, I think we're going to hold off on disclosing the last bits of the data until we select our one candidate and then patent that single compound. So by having a single compound composition of matter patent, which is very different from what you normally do, trying to block tons of chemical space off. We want people to make second generation molecules. We want to give that data to them as quickly as possible. So once we disclose that, we can actually use that as a tool to, um, if they license it for manufacture, we can get them to waive their exclusivity because then we want multiple people to compete on price to make the cheapest possible molecules um, that, that could be manufactured. So I, I think we're trying to feel our way through this uh, IP system, but you're right, it's very tricky. Yeah, I right, could talk. I have a question about your slide on the force field. Uh, you showed a big potential, uh, and I guess the assumption there just before the PhD student the machine that you showed. Um, yeah. <laughs> the assumption there, I guess, is that the force field, it's just a derivative of the potential with respect to the coordinates. Do things change substantially if that property is not there and the forces are not conserved? It's just a question of throwing a couple of PhD students in the machine yeah. grinding. Yeah, yeah. Think, or how do you do it? With that? Everything becomes very hard because we no longer have statistical mechanics of the, the Boltzmann kind, right? Yeah. I mean, we're very lucky here that we know the exact relationship between the unnormalized probability density is e to the minus u, yeah. and then we know what the u is. But things like free energy calculations become quite difficult if you can't rely upon that relationship. So. There's, there have been force fields that have been accidentally non-conservative because they include a bunch of history dependence or unconverged uh, joint polarizability or something like that. And it, it's just, you can do cool stuff with them, but it's very difficult to do the kind of stat mech that we've done. You, to mean, you can do mechanical chemistry that way if you yeah, change you your bond, sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, it's just, it becomes a lot harder to do these kinds of drug discovery types. So there's no systematics that you know how to do with that. For non-conservative force yeah. fields. That, uh, none that have been applied to computing binding to these. Thank you. Um, a related question, right? So, I mean, here the force field like doesn't go to quantum chemistry, right? So in the, uh, the paper that I showed- This like, is your like, quantum chemistry. Exactly. <laughs> like the, uh, you know, the one I showed yeah. with uh, the respiratory aerosol and that binding. So there we corrected like with a DFT surrogate that's ordinate, you know, with Tom Miller. Um, but just like kind of operationalizing all that with software was such a mess. So, just, so even with all the, whether it's learned potentials or like the classical ones, there isn't an easy way to correct for that and kind of run that. Is there efforts in that direction to make all this interact with machine learning methods oh, in a better way? That's a great question. Yeah. So we'd like to get rid of these very crappy approximations, but they're very convenient because you can run them very quickly. So uh, we've taken a few different approaches to that. One of them is that 
the new OpenMM, which is an open GPU accelerated from the great of NVIDIA uh, simulation package that we co develop, uh, has built in support for certain machine learning course fields where we've hard coded uh, fast CUDA kernels, and then the GPU is just getting faster for the machine learning part of it, right? So you can run that, actually run MLMM simulations, where say your ligand is at this very high level of, of quantum chemistry surrogate using machine learning force fields. So that's one way to do it. Another way would be to rebuild these force fields or some possibly higher order version of this force field that matches that uh, the conformational space and the potential as close as you can, and then do what you've tried to do, which is reweighting, but often you have to avoid these mismatches between the, the potentials. If you just tried to go from MM, like any MM to a DFT, it would just be insanity. You get no effective sample size. So there are ways to switch between them using non equilibrium switching, and we've, we've explored those as well. So you start in MM, and you switch a little bit using very short trajectories that hopefully maintain your sample weights when you get out all the way to the uh, ML side of things. So there's a few different strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. That was, that was just fascinating. Thank you 